And I'm, I'm going to need to get through this door. Sure. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, let's, uh, can, can it stand against the wall there? In the corner, right in the corner. George? Can that stand right there? There we go. I used to play one of these too some time ago. All right. Um, yeah, can you just take this out and put it on, the, on that side of the stage? All right. Thank you. Okay. Just got to get our props ready first before we begin. All right. I'll explain later. Bible study should be fun, right? <laughs> All right, I think I've got everything that I need for right now. There's a, there's a few of you who have received little signs. I'll be calling on you later as we go through, and um, I'll explain it as, as we go on. All right. Friends, I want you to pray while we go through the study together. Um, we all have sinful natures and the study of God's righteousness is it's foreign to us it's like learning Chinese for an Englishman totally totally opposite to what and so th the Bible says if you hunger and thirst for righteousness what will happen you'll be filled and so let's hunger and thirst let's pray um, Pray for me especially. Um, I, I really, my prayer is that I'd be able to, through God's Spirit, break down this seemingly complex subject of the righteousness of God being in a sinful human being by faith in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of embarking on a journey into your righteousness. And Lord, thank you for the privilege of having your righteousness come into each one of us. Your perfect, your, the perfection of your character shining out of each one of us. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that as we go through this study that your Holy Spirit will dominate every word that is spoken and every word that is heard in this wonderful two-way miracle that takes place when the Word of God is opened and spoken. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Dwayne was excited. He was very, very excited. And any of you who have ever walked into the showroom with enough money saved for a brand new car, you know what the feeling is like. You walk into that, that showroom with the, the glistening tile floors, with the spotlights that angled down on the new vehicles and the reflection and the sparkle of those lights in the shiny lacquer that surrounds that new vehicle. It's, it's wonderful. I've only bought a new car once in my life. So I know that feeling. And so Dwayne walked into, this, into the showroom and as you know, the, <laughs> the salesman is always ready there to, to welcome you in. 
And um, so he walked around and um, he was in the Lexus showroom. He had done all the looking around at the, the Toyotas. And right next door was the Lexus showroom and he decided he would go in there because he had budgeted in such a way that he can just put a little bit of extra money towards that brand new Lexus. And so he walked around and he looked at the silver grays and then he looked at the, the golden, the metallic gold colors and he thought, no, 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 he, he would like a, a silver Lexus. And he sat in, opened the door, got inside, the smell of the leather, you know, pressed a little button for the sunroof and it opened and closed and he said, this is it. And the salesman was right there. And, and so Dwayne said, um, yes, sir, this, this is the car I'd like to take. Yeah, the, the Lexus sedan, the four-door, um, a very practical vehicle, very reliable. Um, and so they went into the, the salesman's office, and uh, Dwayne slips his checkbook out, ready to write down the, the, the deposit and, uh, and issue the check for his, his brand new Lexus. And the salesman there with a contract and... Um, Dwayne decided he would take a payment plan and um, Dave as he's uh, doing the paperwork and the salesman notices that um, Dwayne has a little bag with him. Almost like a, you know, a little, a little tog bag that you take to the gym. And so Dwayne asks him, how long is it going to take to fill out the contract? So the salesman said, well, five, ten minutes, five, ten minutes. So Dwayne says, do you mind if I slip into the restroom real quick? So the salesman says, sure, I'll finish up the, pa uh, uh, the paperwork while you do that. So he opens the restroom door, and he disappears for a moment. Salesman is busy, uh, busy um, filling out the paperwork, and... Um, the salesman can't believe what he, uh, what he sees when Dwayne comes walking out. Dwayne was dressed in a nice suit and tie, quite dignified. And um, when he comes out with his little tog bag, I think Dwayne needed someone to help him in the restroom. But anyway, um, the salesman had finished the contract and uh, Dwayne didn't come out yet. So um, the, the, the salesman came to the restroom door to try and help him. And here comes Dwayne. He had changed. He looked a little different. He had taken his tie and his jacket off. And Dwayne, D Dwayne comes out with his tog bag. He sits down with the, the salesman salesman says, Dwayne, I've, I've done it all. <laughs> You've changed. Why have you changed? He says, no, 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 don't worry. I've got it all under control. And um, so Dwayne signs, gives the check. The salesman takes the keys out of the, the drawer and hands it to Dwayne. And Dwayne walks over to the brand new Lexus and he takes out a harness, some, a heavy-duty harness. And he takes the harness out, he unrolls it, and he puts it around himself. And the salesman can't believe his eyes. What is this guy doing? This guy's an idiot. And um, he, Dwayne's got it all worked out. And you know, now that he's, his shirt is off, um, the salesman can see that this, um, this guy is pretty muscle bound. I mean, he has been working out. And so D Dwayne takes the harness, he, he straps himself, puts it right around his body. He's got it all worked out. And the salesman says, what are you doing? He says, no, I'm, I'm going to take my car. He says, what do you mean? You don't need all that stuff to take the car. And he says, no, I do. He walks up to the front of the car, he takes the hook, 
and he hooks it onto the, the front of the car. He leans in, he puts it in neutral, and he starts pulling the car out of the, the showroom. <laughs> the salesman goes, what an idiot. Sir, excuse me, um, um, uh, hold on a second. There's an engine in this car that you just need to start with that key. And Dwayne says, well, um, I know. But I'm going to use the engine just in case the pulling gets tough. Because I have trained pretty well. You can see I'm strong enough to pull this car. So why should I use the engine? I'm going to pull the car so when I get on the downhills, I can just get in. I don't need to use any gas. It will be comfortable. When I get to the uphills, what I'll do is I'll start the engine, and then I'll drive it. And we all laugh. <laughs> yes, it's a very funny story. And yes, it's a little parable. It's a little parable of what Christians do every day. It's a little parable of what Christians do every day. And yes, I didn't wear my suit and my, my, my tie today. I'm going to be speaking to you all day like this. Because the righteousness of God cannot come by man's efforts. The righteousness of God can only come by believing that it's under the hood. And so, when we talk about God's power that produces good works, we are talking like that engine that's under the bonnet, or rather, excuse me, the hood of the car. And so, if this is you and I as a Christian, there we are right in the center here. And on the opposite end, we have man's power. And this is Dwayne with his harness. So I, I represent Dwayne today with his harness on. And um, this is me over here. and maybe some of us sitting here today. You see, my friends, when the Bible says the just shall live by faith, it means exactly that. And yes, there is a distance between God's power, that beautiful, glistening Lexus engine under the hood. There is a little bit of distance here. It doesn't, it doesn't get forced on to us. It gets given to us by something called faith. And I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning because we're going to see Dwayne. We're going to see Dwayne in in Second Timothy, chapter three. Second Timothy, chapter three. All right. Oh, man, did I get my, my hand slapped this week? Oh, and did it hurt? Second Ta Ch Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. I'm asking you to pray, right? Are we all in, in a prayerful mode? Are we all in a, in a mode where, the, where the, the sinful nature can be rebuked? It says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiveness, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I'm going to stop right there. 
All right. Now, where are all the people with the green, with the green little plaques? I'd like you to just come up in no random order. Just make a line um, on either side of this. Um, there are some tacks at the top. Actually, I'll hold the tacks for you. And I'd like you to just pin under this all the green, the, the green little signs. Yeah, just put your tack there. I'll hold it for you. I'll hold the box for you. And um, just put them like this, one below the other. There we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Just put them like that. Very good. All right. Now, how many of you, how many of we, how many of us think that these characteristics belong, uh, just the, the green ones, not the white ones yet, okay, just the green ones. And um, I'm actually quite embarrassed how many there are. Wow. Look how many green ones there are. Um, I hope we can all fit them on here. I didn't plan this out ahead of time. But how many of us think that, that this belongs to people in the world? Let me see your hands. People in the world? Okay. How many of you think that Paul's talking to Christians? Woohoo! Okay, the majority vote. Thank you. That's a, that's a good idea. Are these all the green ones? Wow! Ah... Uh, <laughs> um, wow. Um, hmm. Hoping in a fit, fit them all on. I should have made them slightly smaller. Okay, what I want to do is when we, f when we finish all of these, I'm going to turn it to the side. Okay, let's read the scripture again. I'll hold the box for you. Second Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. All right. So now we're going to put some down this side as well. Whew. I didn't realize there were so many. Um, we said slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All right, now comes, here comes the revelation. Having a form of godliness. Who does that apply to? Do the, do, do the atheists have a form of godliness? No. Who has a form of godliness? People who go to church. Now, look at just how many of these character traits there are. There are so many, the whole the whole pillar is filled. Wow. So let me ask you something. What happens when Dwayne pulls the car? Does it go very fast? No, it doesn't go very fast. Okay. Now, let's have a look at this side. And if you turn in your Bibles to Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1. Now we see the opposite and verse, from verse 2 to verse 7. Second Peter chapter 1. And uh, the people with the white now can start making a line in front of the opposite side. Second Peter chapter 1. I'm going to come to this side. And uh, here are the texts. And uh, you can come right up straight across below that one. Second Peter chapter 1. 
It's verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord, of Jesus our Lord. As His, what? Divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. By which He has given us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature. Wow! We can partake of His perfect character. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. To knowledge self-control. To self-control perseverance. To perseverance godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness love. Kind of opposite, isn't it? Okay, now to Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22 and 23. I mean, this is a... a Two quick lists. Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness self-control against such there is no law all right oh i'm so glad there's a nice long list here too and uh you could uh, put put those there and uh, this one here Now, friends, today, this is like a mirror for us to look into. This is like a mirror for us to look into. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we are, we are very disturbed to see what happens when people deny the power of God. When I read this list, traditionally, I always thought that this list applied to unbelievers, to pagans. Because when you read the list, you know, lovers of themselves, unforgiving, boasters, haughty, unloving, lovers of money, you don't think that's in the church. You think that that's outside of the church. But my friends, the sinful nature does not want to put the key in the car for some reason. For some reason, the sinful nature wants to take this big hook here and hook it onto the car and pull it out of the showroom. It insists on doing it as embarrassing as it is with everybody looking around at it. You see, these people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. So here's, here we are, it's called righteousness by faith, right? So here I am. I have now a choice. Do I believe in my own strength with my harness or do I believe in the engine underneath the hood that can pull that car at, I'm sure, close to 200 miles an hour? Okay? So here is my faith. It's either a counterfeit faith that I reach out to my own strength and look at the result. I'm denying the power. I'm relying on my ability to have that form of godliness. I try hard because since I've been young, I've been asked to perform in school. I've been asked to perform at work. I've been 
in the human economy, I'm used to looking to myself in order to be a better person. Right? So when I come to church, this is what I do. I read all the things that the church teaches and I go home and I try harder to do it. And this is what I call man's counterfeit faith. Because Dwayne had to believe that he could pull that car. And he had trained hard. He had been in the gym. He had done all his pull-ups, sit-ups, chin-ups, and every kind of ups that you can get, he had done. And he was strong. He was fit. He was in shape. He could pull that car to a degree. And that's what our counterfeit faith tells us. But my friends, when we call on the Holy Spirit to give us the gift of faith and we turn it to God's power and we reach out in faith to everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us, faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. But we've got to want it and we've got to ask for it. And so when you and I reach out with the gift of faith that God gives us, that we can, that we can um, have His righteousness, which righteousness means right doing, that we can have all these good things in our lives, my friends, we receive them by faith and God's power works in us and through us. But the righteousness is by faith. These things cannot be pinned onto me in my own strength. It cannot come onto me because I, I want it and I'm going to work at getting it. And I'm going to just sit with my list and I'm going to grit my teeth. I'm going to do it harder. I'm going to do it better. I'm going to keep trying. I'm gonna... It doesn't work that way. The people that do that actually have a form of godliness because they really are denying the power. Does it make sense? They're denying the power. My friends, and, and it doesn't matter if there's a form, it doesn't matter if there's a form where a person manages to keep the Sabbath and they manage to give their tithe, that's part of the form. It doesn't matter if the, if the person isn't cussing or they, they're an upstanding citizen. If you look in their lives, you're going to see these little things sprinkled through. You're going to see these little things proud, brutal in their relationships without self-control, unthankful, traitors, unholy, lovers of pleasure, headstrong, lovers of themselves, unforgiving. These little things you'll see sprinkled through their lives because they deny the power. They're relying on their own faith in their own strength. This has been going on since the fall of mankind. It's been going on. And Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they were doing the very same thing. And the Bible has good, good examples to show us. Okay? Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the whole New Testament, you all know the story. For the longest time, he was a very religious man. So if you go to your Bible, um, to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, here is a person with a form of godliness. Philippians chapter 3, Verse 4. And we ask ourselves the question, where do we fit in all of this? It says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh or in their own strength, I have, I have more so. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, and concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul kept the law perfectly. But did he have the power of God in his life? You see, my friends, Paul's faith was in the system of Judaism. Paul's faith was in his knowledge of the letter of the law. And so he reached out from here by faith, a counterfeit faith, he reached out to this. He had a form of godliness. He denied the power. And what did he have? He was a murderer. Until on the Damascus Road, he realized what a wretched man I am. Who can save me from this body of death? And he reached out by faith. And he, he believed that the same God that created the universe, the same, the same God that raised the dead, the same God that healed the, the lame and made the blind to see, that same God has the power to change his sinful, fallen nature. That same God has got that power. He did not deny the power. He reached out to the power, and the power of God was manifest in him. Righteousness by faith. So you say to me, okay, Pastor, <laughs> that's good news. That's, that's real great, but I don't buy it. All those things down there cannot be mine just by believing. Surely, hold on a second, Pastor. James says, faith without works is dead. I, there is something that I have to do. I need to have discipline. I need to, I need to um, try. I do need to try hard. So we go to our Bibles and we read in James 2 verse 20. Yes, that's exactly what it says. It's exactly what it says. James was dealing with a group of people who had, had counterfeited faith and say, I just have to believe I can do whatever I want to do. Okay, James 2 verse 20. Actually, this whole passage um, from verse 14, um, but if you go to James 2 verse 20, it says exactly that. But do you want to, to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? It says, even the demons believe and they tremble. In verse, verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So faith without works is dead. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Your observation is correct. What kind of faith? My friends, if you have faith and then none of these works you are denying the power, and therefore, there will be no works. Okay? So, counterfeit faith will have no works, and it's dead anyway. But I think what James was talking about, he was talking about the true gift of faith. He was talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, that faith that reaches out to the power of God, if, if, you, if God's power is not working in your life, your faith is dead. You've obviously got the counterfeit faith. I'm going to sit my head, myself over the head with a two-by-four. <laughs> so does that make sense? Of course. You see, God's power has got such a phenomenal working in our lives. But my friends, I'm a human being with you, I have a sinful nature just like you do. Why am I not seeing God's power in my life the way I'd like to? You see, and this is where righteousness by faith takes on a beautiful little 
scenic view. Because Jesus Christ also experienced righteousness by faith. You see, Jesus didn't have an advantage over you and I. Jesus came as a man, and he reached out to his Father's power by faith, just like he calls you and I to do. Jesus says in John 5, 19, and you don't need to look it up because I've memorized it. It's one of my favorite scriptures. He says, the Son can do nothing by himself. Only what the Father does, the Son does. Because what the Father does, the Son sees and does likewise. So my friends, in all the years that I've been a Christian, here's the bottom line. You've got to start your day right. If you read through the Gospels as to what Jesus' secrets were, how did Jesus live with the power of God? Oops, I've got this the wrong way around. This needs to be this way around. How did Jesus live by God's power? You know that before the sun rose in the morning, Jesus was up asking for the gift of faith. And through faith, reaching and receiving all the, the gifts that God... Remember last time we had the umbrella that we've got to take? We've got to take the gifts that God gives to us by faith and walk believing that we have them and move forward? That's what it means to have righteousness by faith. My friends, if we believe and we call on God's power to work in our lives and we surrender to that power, He is going to work in us. And you've noticed I've left the harness on me. Because with the sinful nature, we're always going to have that harness and that temptation to go hook up the car ourselves and to connect that ratchet up and pull it ourselves. You see, we have a work schedule. We have household duties. We've got financial pressures. And what happens is the enemy uses this, this whirlwind of, of human circumstance to overwhelm us and get our focus back onto man's power to do man's works. So starting our day right, understanding that righteousness comes by faith, the power of God comes by faith. And faith is a spiritual gift. It's a gift that's given to us by the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit connecting with our spirits and opening our minds to fully surrender, to, to condemn sin in our flesh, and to call on the power of God to work in us, we're going to be pulling our car throughout our day, puffing and sweating all day long. And our Christianity is going to have a form of godliness because we've denied the power thereof. Is this practical enough? And so in those early morning hours, guarding the nighttime hours so that those, the, the birth of the new day can be directly connected to the rebirth of our experience on a day-to-day -day basis. What did Paul say? I die daily. I die daily. I daily re rebuke and condemn this sinful nature that wants to go it alone. I daily surrender this to God. I daily call on the gift of faith. I daily call on the Holy Spirit to illuminate my mind and show me the beautiful works and the power of God that can work in me. And so when you, read, when you read the Gospels, you'll have this theme coming over and over and over again. 
My friends, the fact that we are churchgoers does not give us the keys to the pearly gates. 2 Timothy chapter 3 shows us that there are a long, long list of things in God's church amongst His people because they're denying the power thereof. I'm going to close with this scripture. I'm going to close with this scripture in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. It's almost like the Bible was addressed more to the children of Israel and to believing Christians than it was to pagans. And here again, and here again, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, it's to Christians. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. For many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. My friends, if you just read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the treasures of the kingdom are summarized there. The treasures of the kingdom are summarized there. Matthew 5, verse 6. Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. And the very well-known little chorus that we sing time and time again. The words are so simple that they just go right through our minds and the impact of them are, are lost. It says in Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. My friends, today I'm, I'm inviting you to get rid of your harness. You cannot do it by yourself. You know, Dwayne had rehearsed putting that harness on so well that he doesn't even know how to get it off. <laughs> there it is. God promises us more power than we can even dream of. And through prayer through surrender, through focus, and through a response to the constant yearning of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working on each one of us and say, give it up, give it up. Forget about your form of godliness. Come and reach out to the power of God and take it. It's there for you. Get rid of that harness. But that stubborn exterior, that, that prideful spirit that's in us grits our teeth and we write out our check to the church and we say, I've done what I need to do. Or we wait till the sun to set right before the sun sets. We don't do anything until the, the second hand ticks over. I've done my deed. Guys, all those are like filthy rags. All our deeds, all that is to do with man's producing work is rubbish in God's sight. What God wants is like a little child for us to come and kneel before Him in humble surrender and say, Lord, I need Thee. Oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. And the light shines down from heaven it illuminates our minds and we can see the simplicity and the purity of God's works in us by grace.
How many of you have a harness today that's been burdening you down? How many of you have been wrestling, trying to be a better person? My friends, today I want to invite you to accept Christ's righteousness by faith. In the quietness of this morning hour, with a simple prayer of a child, that power can be yours. And so, um, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Before too long, my friends, we're going to be speeding off in another week. Now is a precious moment, a precious moment to just be still and know that He is God. Father in heaven, I call upon your Spirit to fall upon us. We ask for forgiveness for our sins. We ask for forgiveness for our stubborn insistence of carrying the load. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will set every person free to have the power of God working in their lives. If there's anyone today who feels the Spirit of God calling them to a life of freedom, Jesus said to his disciples, the truth will set you free. My friends, I feel that the truth of God has been presented here this morning. And only you and God know if you're truly denying the power or not. And so if you, I'm going to make two calls this morning, and I'd like you to come forward, because we're going to have prayer after the service for that yoke to come off. I'm going to make two calls. The one is, if, if you've been carrying that harness around and you want to get rid of it, just come this morning. For the closing prayer. Come to the front of the church. And the second thing I'm going to ask is if you've never fully surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to invite you to come. Our prayer warriors are here to be with you. After the dismissal, we will pray with you and support you. If you want the power of God to work in your life today, just kneel where you are and ask Him to do it right now in Jesus' name. It's a gift of God. If you want that power to work in your life, you want to stop denying it, just kneel where you are and call upon it as we, as we close together in prayer. Just kneel where you are. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in humility. We accept your gift on the cross. by the shedding of your blood. And we accept the power of God to work in our life. Remove the yoke of bondage and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. You see how simple that is? That's it right there. I'm going to ask that we stay in an attitude of prayer in the church. Please keep your conversations to the lobby. The deaconesses will come and just escort you out. And if you'd like to have prayer, instead of walking out the back, just walk right down to the front. Our prayer warriors will be here to pray with you. So... We'll dismiss from these um, this front rows now. But please, 
let's just stay in an atmosphere of prayer. Thank you.